have enough time for the um, panelists and also to get some Q&A at the end. So welcome everyone, I'm Alexander Chang, I'm the Curator for Special Projects and Director of Global Arts Programs here at the NYU Asian Pacific American um, Institute. And we want to welcome you so much tonight because this is the very first event we're having in this new space. Um, so kind of exciting. <laughs> So tonight's event, Making the Memory Sacred Art, Human Rights, and Community, is really part of um, a citywide festival um, that is being put on by the Asian American Arts Alliance called Locating the Sacred, and it's been happening for the past two weeks. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to actually go online to um, locatingthesacred.org and check out the remaining six events that are happening. But it's like we're very grateful for um, the Arts Alliance and Nico Deswani, who is the um, the program director there, and you'll hear from him in a bit, um, as well as his staff, Alina Chang and Jindin Sun. Um, and also within NYU, interdepartmentally, um, the Steinhardt Art and Art Professions Department and Centers for Media, Culture, and History and Center for Religion and Media, um, who are not only co-sponsored um, along with the Archives and Public History program at NYU, but um, they're, uh, the centers and um, the Art and Art Professions Department were also collaborators on this blog. Um, we all kind of got together um, with advisors, including um, some folks who are um, not only advisors, but participants on the blog, um, including, I just want to mention these names, um, Peggy Vale, Kay Ginsburg, Angela Saito, Dipti Desai, Hiroshi Sinari, um, who's on the panel tonight, and Amita Magnani um, at APA, and Ann Melman. Um, we kind of were talking um, about just um, how there's this cross-disciplinary and cross-community investment and interest in these topics, um, engaging in site memory trauma, and also these, these intersections they have with human rights, the human rights um, that are involved in being able to uh, uh, kind of participate in collective mourning and memorialization. And so we really wanted to be able to cross our disciplines in our departments, which um, as you were talking before, kind of in the panel, some of the NYU professors here, you know, sometimes we're very far across campus, and so it's great to be able to come together to do something. Um, I want to thank, in particular, Alex Chang, Anita Magnani, and uh, uh, Ruby here, and Laura at, at the NYU Asian Pacific American Institute for really taking what was a seed of an idea. Okay, I came to Alex several months ago, maybe a year ago, uh, saying that you know we wanted to have a, a bit of a humanities component to this to the citywide festival, and what better partners um, to to help us think about some of these issues? We were specifically interested in the idea of memory and memorial architecture, but that was pretty much as much as we knew and and had elaborated internally. And Alex and the team really took it to a whole different level, created this blog, invited scholars and artists um, from around the world to contribute to this blog and uh, in, including eminent speakers who are here tonight with us. So thank you so much for that. The festival has been going for 10 days and it's an exploration of the sacred. Uh, it's looking at what is sacred in our lives today, what is sacred in our communities, how do we relate to the sacred? So we've had music, dance, theater, exhibitions. This is the third and final talk in the series of talks. We, the first talk we had was called The Power of Sound and Interfaith Exchange at the UN Church. On Tuesday, we had a talk called Damn It, I Want to Be Enlightened, about, about yoga and meditation. Uh, and tonight's panel, Memory, Making the Memory Sacred, sort of completes uh, our humanities portion. The Asian Pacific American Institute at NYU and Alex have curated the beginning of an urgent and necessary dialogue on locating the sacred. Through the vehicle of the blog and this panel, we commence a conversation about art, space, time, values, history, memory, and loss. Our discussion will illustrate how poignant is the challenge and the current political dilemma of understanding the individual and his or her place in the context of our shared community. For many years now, I have personally wondered about whether we still do experience shared memories. We used to all experience the milestones of our country and the world at the same time. Click on to CBS, NBC, ABC at six o'clock. Other than the Olympics, maybe the upcoming election results, a hit TV show, 
and the worst and saddest of tragedies, what are our shared memories, our shared events of both happiness and loss? What histories never get told? Each of our panelists will offer a brief response to the topic at hand, locating and making the memory sacred. Robert uses the instrument of the written word and storytelling in his books and teaching. Steve documents and celebrates the urban folklore right in our own midst. Marita disturbs our easy contentment by challenging how we acknowledge or don't acknowledge the deepest infrastructure of our recent history. And Hiroshi, using his camera, creates a visual platform for each of us to view and contemplate the sheer power of memory. In this month of the harvest, spiritual renewer, a new semester, and the 9-11 anniversary, this topic is especially compelling. With all the noise in the city and the media and our cell phone chatter, we take a moment this evening to investigate and focus on the sacred. Where is it? What is it for each of us? And for the concentric set of communities we are all surrounded by. Coming from the disciplines of literature, history, art, media, religion, and cultural studies, I am pleased to present our panel. I want to begin by thinking about how the question of sacredness has been inflected uh, at Ground Zero, uh, and in particular at the um, National September 11th Memorial that has been open now for a year. Because sacredness has become an extremely powerful and has actually been from the very beginning an extremely powerful discourse uh, at Ground Zero. A discourse in the sense that it has activated many things at that site. Um, things that have uh, defined the space there, defined the processes that went forward uh, from it. But the thing that I think that's most important to think about in relationship to the question of sacredness in Ground Zero was that the ground itself was declared sacred. It was declared sacred by people who were there, but it was also declared sacred by politicians, most um, obviously by Governor, then Governor Pataki, who declared in particular that the footprints, the footprints of the Twin Towers, were sacred and would never be built on, and then that they were sacred all the way down to the bedrock. In other words, they would never be built under. There would be no shopping malls, no uh, subways, no infrastructure under them. That is very much what we see actually completely encoded in the space. Uh, uh, more than 10 years has passed since this happened, but um, that sense of those footprints of the towers, footprints that would, no one would have imagined thinking of as sacred when those towers stood, uh, have been understood to be sacred. And one of the consequences of that is that we have a memorial that is very much about scale. Hi, I'm Steve Zeitlin. I'm the director of City Lore. City Lore was, was, was um, very involved also after September 11th in documenting the shrines and memorials all over New York. Um, and um, we recorded them for almost a year and a half afterwards and then ultimately actually moved a lot of the shrines into the exhibit that was at the New York Historical Society which became part of the mourning process itself. Um, but one of the things about it was that I continually saw September 11th becoming politicized. And um, eventually, you know, with all of the years, that, the years that have transpired, whenever the anniversary comes up and people say, well, would you like to give another talk on 9-11? I always, I always pray. So I thought today I'd talk about uh, some other kinds of work and how I, I've tried to um, work towards figuring out what the sacred is for me and in, in the work I do, I do as well. But much of what City Lord does is to, is to try to look at the, at the sacred nature of memory, uh, the idea of being, of, of the way in which meaning is constructed in life. And I, I kind of feel like uh, God didn't create you know, sacredness or heaven or, or hell. What he did is give human beings the tools to create memory. Uh, you know, if he existed, he, what he was doing was giving us the tools to create memory, uh, it, which was, uh, you know, as, as somebody said, you know, uh, to, uh, to create something out of nothing, that's something, which I always, I always thought was an interesting uh, idea. Um, one of the projects that City Lore has been involved in for 
quite a while is Place Matters. And it's a project that uh, tries to defend places and put value on places that are threatened in New York. One of the uh, ideas I toyed with was to try to think about what if there existed a currency uh, for memory, a currency for the sacred in uh, values uh, rather than, than simply money itself. And I wrote this very brief piece like this. As a folklorist, I sometimes speak metaphorically about cultural capital and social currency. But what if there were an actual currency of memory and meaning? A hundred years of history and generations of memory were not enough to keep Coney Island's house under the roller coaster or Dorothy Day's Spanish camp or CBGB's from being demolished. But what if memories, associations, and values were transformed into units of meaningful exchange? This unit might be called a Mayan, a unit backed not by gold bullion, but by human values and associations. What I deal with is um, narratives, and that's really kind of the word that I want to be focusing on here, and how public and private narratives are attached to places, which oftentimes means an inherent contestation that is created. Um, and I'm really, in, in much of my work, focused on the consequences of that for racial and ethnic identity and particularly for Asian Americans and, and some of the earlier work that I've done. And um, a lot of that for me is not just an intellectual question. Um, much of my work and my desire to merge personal narrativity with more scholarly, traditional academic work um, comes from the fact that I am the cousin, nephew, grandson, <coughs> and son of Japanese Americans who were returned during World War II, which means I grew up hearing snippets of memory that my family would recall in, in very select moments about this place called camp, a place that wasn't in the history text, wasn't in the, the curriculum that I learned as a child, and I was always the obnoxious kid who would ask the question, why aren't you learning this? Where is it in the textbook? And fortunately, my teachers would understand that for the most part. Um, and so I, I want to leave, have a couple questions here. How do we shape the meanings of places? What is that process? I like the idea here of, of finding some other kind of language. Rights is obviously kind of a very vexed language that leads to contestations that are acrimonious and unproductive. Um, and particularly when the stories we inherit are fragmented, when they are troubling to the institutions that have the greatest control over the, the currency that define these places and that control, therefore, the shaping of public narratives. Because obviously one of the inherent problems of telling relocation honestly and faithfully in a public realm is to tell something that is inherently problematic and inconsistent with ideas about American identity. And Asian Americans themselves represent the group that has not been folded into the larger American identity. Racist ideology that was manifest in laws barring them from naturalization, from land ownership, from interracial marriage, and practices such as housing segregation and violence really left Asian Americans out of the larger national narrative. And so inserting their history has always been a deeply vexed problem. Japanese American history, public history, has become weighted with relocation, not the larger history. Only the prehistory can help explain how relocation was really not something surprising, but sort of you know, along a logical chain of events. And particularly for me, what's concerning is whose voices are not included in that history. Children, women. I'm always haunted by a story that I came across when I was writing my book um, about Idaho, where my grandfather had uh, unfortunately died, whose family was going to be released when the camp was closing. She was ill. And because she felt she was going to be a burden to her family, she drowned herself in the canal, one of the border I, I, I've never been able to sort of let that, that little newspaper article go. Um, and it's important for me then to find spaces where I can engage people to, to recall that that's part of that history too, the people that didn't leave those places, the people whose lives and families were forever changed by a tragedy in the same way that I know that my family was. And part of that was a divisiveness, the breaking up of the community as a result of that. My thought is I'm more going to be more like an uh, artist's talk, um, talking about the creation of my um, uh, project called uh, A 
Night of Elephants, and also how uh, from there how I arrived to uh, this project or tree project that I've been doing. And so I'm going to be sort of like traveling through the idea of memory, sacredness, human rights slash tree rights, and community. Um, around the time of planning this, um, I was away from New York for two weeks, and my mother. Uh, was calling me all the time, but she couldn't reach me. So she was worried, and was, and finally I, I got to talk to her, and then she said, um, she thought that I went to India to see elephants for my project and died from tsunami. Because there was a, a Sri Lanka tsunami at the time. And somehow this idea, or like a wild imagination of my mother, <laughs> interested me. <laughs> interested me. And thinking, going to India to study elephants as a warrior was like such an inspiration to me. So then I went to India. <laughs> <laughs> because I went to um, like see uh, research elephants at the zoo here or like the zoo like in different places of, of America, it's always in the cage. It's very sad. So I really couldn't get the feelings of the elephants. So. India was, was uh, I mean, it's also a country, a uh, birthplace of Buddha. So in some ways for me, like the sacred feeling that, you know, I have, like I associate with India and the elephants and finding elephants, this was a very interesting project for me. I remember when I was at the Cultural Affairs Department and um, another question I pondered when I was there, I'm not there anymore, um, is, isn't this all happening too soon? Um, the James Young had written a book on Oklahoma City. I think it took is it ten years for them to actually do the uh, the uh, memorial. I mean, it started almost immediately, and uh, just didn't seem any pause for us to mourn or to reflect, to engage. Uh, it was just build the buildings, which I can understand. Sort of like in Marita's work, go shopping. Let's build the, you know, let's let's build the buildings. But the the idea of doing it so fast, um, if I you think, recall, it 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 started soon. Yeah, yeah. I think this actually relates in an interesting way to the issue of internment camps and how to memorialize them because, and that's very similar in, in Argentina, sites where there's actually been a time gap. Right, so where there isn't this rush to memorialization for whatever political reasons, right, produce very different kinds of debates, right? The debate is quite different there because the actual sites are are deliberately remote, right? So if they're memorialized in LA or the museum, is that the same thing? Right? But also then there's a whole sort of generational element, I don't know if you want to say more about that, to how the memory of those sites gets reconstructed or, or to put it out. Anybody else have a comment on time from a, from a um, when something happens, whether you need more time or reflection? Just a curious, uh, yes, yes. Um, when the 9-11 um, as an event happened, um, I, th that was the time I started teaching at NYU. So that was like a, maybe like two days after my class started. And it was a really surprising event. <laughs> yes. And I was there too. I was actually near there. And I'm, I'm actually in the uh, um, uh, Newsweek paper, um, a Newsweek magazine, because I'm running in the picture uh, from the, the, the smoke. But the, um, because I was teaching a class, and then the, this class was a project class, I kept asking students, what do you think about the, the war that, that, that was about to happen? Because as soon as 9-11 um, happened, the, the, the mood of the media was so um, forceful in um, sort of like activating people into anger, and then um, so that, that they're up for war. And this was, in some ways, this very hurried feeling that I got. And I, it was so puzzling for me, uh, because I'm from Hiroshima. And the way we think about um, these things is, is, is not about retaliation. And basically, it's just, we never forget, but there's no um, 
poss possibility of, of getting upset with, with the others. Um, so for me, this, because in some ways 9-11 was uh, really the first um, thing that I experienced in my real life that, that were like a major catastrophic event. So this, this everything about the media and the way it led to the, the war was so hurried and then so impactful for me. We, we were very conscious of, of not, not only the hurriedness, but the fact that New York had this, what, this incredible, heartfelt outpouring of grief and expressed in yes. unbelievably creative ways all over, in all five boroughs of the city. And, and I was, as I was documenting, I was so struck continually that it was being harnessed for the purposes of going to war. It was always like, look at this outpouring of grief. This is why we have to go yes. kill, you know, everything. So, so there was really an enormous uh, sense of that. And even, you know, by the, the time the exhibit was, was up, I was already feeling like, gosh, you know, I, I don't want to play into this uh, by, by documenting the, the sincere response of New Yorkers to it. Well, I would just add that if, if we were actually to use the template of human rights, to talk about 9 11, actually just call it a piece on this, but it, it would actually force us to situate 9 11 within a whole series of events that are taking place. So, so to think about the, um, the torture uh, and the violations of human rights that the United States participated in in the wake of 9 11. Certainly, we weren't the only ones, right? And to think about the hundreds of thousands of people who died in, in the wake of that moment, right? which is something that a memorial and a museum situated at Ground Zero will never really be able um, to do. And the other thing that I wanted to bring up um, the, the big um, absence of this uh, footprint of the, um, the World Trade Center. Um, that site and the way it's, it, it looks um, resembles so much of American minimalism, which is a very, uh, one of the, the champion of the American contemporary movement. And, and it's like minimalism slash art art, where they create, like if you go to the uh, Beacon, you see these very similar to this 9-11 memorial, this big box of uh, absence from the ground and there's nothing. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, uh, when I actually saw this, I was thinking minimalism. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting for me because minimalism, in some ways, is very American. Any other questions? Well, on that note, I want to thank the panel very much for a wonderful, inspiring <laughs>